people with the classical MPNs, P. vera, ET, and myelofibrosis can have quite widely varying uh, prognosis. Uh, myelofibrosis certainly the, the carries the worst prognosis of all of those conditions, but even within MF the range of life expectancies based on the international prognostic scoring system is varies from about two years in the worst category to more than 10 years in the best category. For patients with myelofibrosis either arising on its own or in a background of essential thrombocythemia or polycythemia vera, there is a significant risk of developing leukaemia. Probably about 1 in 5 or 20 percent of patients may develop leukaemia. The key symptoms of myelofibrosis are related to constitutional symptoms. That means fever, weight loss, um, gastrointestinal issues and so on, and splenomegaly. But uh, myelofibrosis patients also have variable abnormalities in blood cell count, so most of these may be anemic, some may be thrombocytopenic, and some may be also neutropenic. Or on the other hand, some patients may have high number of platelets and high leukocyte number. The symptoms, however, are, are quite widespread and may include uh, something from quite subtle fatigue to bone pain to weight loss. They often have symptoms associated with their enlarged spleen, which may be abdominal pain. They may feel full very early after eating a meal. They may have some bowel disturbance. They have a f often are, have a fever as well. So these symptoms can sometimes be difficult to discern from other issues. Um, when one is ex looking at for signs for these patients, um, patients with advanced myelofibrosis often um, are very cachectic. They've lost a lot of weight. In most cases, I would suspect a diagnosis of myelofibrosis in a patient presenting with splenomegaly, often quite massive splenomegaly, or in patients who have abnormal blood counts, particularly with a leukoerythroblastic blood picture. And the, the diagnostic workup, of course, would start with you know, examination and history taking, looking primarily for hepatosplenomegaly, in rare cases extramedullary hematopoiesis, constitutional symptoms such as pruritus, sweats and weight loss, and on the, and on the blood film obviously the, the presence of immature red cells and granulocytes, often with, you, you may have thrombocytosis or neutrophilia or later in the course of the disease you may have anemia and thrombocytopenia and so on. And then confirmation of the diagnosis, I think now pretty much everyone would, would do a, a JAK mutation. So further investigations to confirm a suspicion of idiopathic myelofibrosis would now include a, a JAK2V617F mutation. And that we would expect to find in about 30 to 50 percent of patients with idiopathic myelofibrosis. So its absence certainly doesn't exclude the diagnosis. Um, but its presence essentially confirms it in a compatible clinical picture. Um, it would still be important to perform a bone marrow biopsy to confirm the extent of myelofibrosis, um, to look at um, other supportive features like megakaryocyte morphology, and importantly to perform cytogenetic analysis because there's evidence that, that cytogenetic abnormalities confer an additional worsening of prognosis. For MF, there's uh, several therapeutic options that are available. We can uh, try or at least uh, evaluate the possibility to perform a bone marrow transplantation using a, a healthy donor in the family or uh, registered on a, on a donor bank. Following a patient with primary myeloid fibrosis is difficult and it's also heavy for the doctor because while we can see a patient with PV or ET just a couple of times during the year or even once in the year, patients with primary myeloid fibrosis need shorter follow-up and very accurate follow-up. Of course, it depends on the kind of disorder. It depends on how it is important, the splenomegaly, on how are significant the constitutional symptoms and, of course, the kind of therapy that I prescribe to the patients.